Hi, this is John Blossom, and I'm pleased to be speaking to students of the New School today on the signal economy. This is a little bit different format than what I typically do for an on-air hangout. Uh, usually I have guests and we chat about things. Uh, this is a little bit more of a lecture format, so I'm sorry for that. Um, I will be uh, pausing for a couple of times during the presentation to uh, answer questions that people may have. Uh, but otherwise, I'll be going through the deck that I have provided to the students. And um, at a later time, I may do this a little bit more professionally with uh, on-air slides for uh, people to be able to look at a little bit more comfortably. Uh, but for now, what I think I'm going to do is to chat a little bit and then switch to uh, my slides on Google Drive, uh, where you'll be able to see them in this video a little bit fuzzily, but for the students, you'll be able to see them much more clearly. Uh, and again, for the uh, benefit of the students that are going to be looking at this video, I remind you uh, to have your questions in the course area there that the new school has provided on the Instructure platform, okay? So when we get to the point of being able to uh, respond to questions there, then I'll be uh, looking to uh, that platform for some uh, input. And I'll pause a couple of times during the presentation to field your questions. So without further ado, uh, students should have their SlideShare link and or their link to Google Drive. And you will see where I am in the slides as I switch over into the uh, version of the slides that you'll see in my, my uh, desk sharing here on Google Hangouts. So it's not going to be visually perfect for you. Uh, we can certainly do this more slickly, but this will do for now. And I hope that you uh, find my narration of the slides to be useful. OK, so we're going to pop over to my desktop here and take a look at the signal economy. Uh, this is a presentation that I did a few weeks ago at a conference in Philadelphia. Uh, so yeah, these are recycled slides, but uh, it's pretty much leading ed edge thought, so I hope that you get a lot out of it. And we should be doing this for somewhere around 45 minutes, I guess. So plan accordingly if you're uh, watching this either live or in the recorded format. So um, here is the signal economy, publishing su success in a world web of sensors, senses, and semantics. And just to frame this a little bit, this was a presentation for publishers. There are certainly other angles that we can take uh, on this for manufacturing and what have you, but the signal economy certainly has major impact on what people are doing in the world of publishing. So uh, just briefly, uh, this is just reiterating some of the materials that you have in your course pack already. Uh, I've been an industry analyst for about 15 years. I've been in the content industry for more years than that, and technology even more years. But um, so that's just a way of saying that I think I know what I'm talking about on a good day, and I hope that you find uh, some of this information to be of use for you in the course. So, starting first, you know what is this? What is signal? This is a, a fuzzy sounding word, but I think there's some pretty concrete and specific things that we need to take into account um, for what it, to me is a new perspective on information. So. Signal, if we're going to look at the dictionary definition of a signal, uh, it's a gesture, action, or sound that's used to convey information or instructions. And I think that kind of nails on the head why this concept of signal is so important for the content industry. Uh, because it's about looking at information and deriving clear status and action indicators that are derived from complex inputs. It's not just that we have uh, a simple gesture, but it, there's something complicated behind that gesture. And it's not just that we have a triggering action, we could have a range of complex triggering actions that bring us to um, delivering a signal. And so what that means to me is that we're talking about highly actionable information at the right place in time. And that's the real difference that this concept of signal is bringing to media and information. Uh, where do we get signal? Well, the good information is that uh, signal is available anywhere from anything at any time. And the way I look at it is that signal is the most abundant knowledge resource today, if we know how to harvest it. 
And so we're, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about this signal concept for a while. We already are for many quarters. And I think that uh, the more literate you are in this concept of signal, the better you'll be able to get your hand around things such as big data. And it's important in part because now everything, and I think we can say pretty much everything, can generate signal these days. Um, and when we talk about web signal, signal from things that uh, are connected to the web, uh, the web is connected via something called Internet Protocol. That's the uh, computer communications protocol that helps uh, machines talk to one another on the Internet. And uh, that protocol was running out of machine addresses not so long ago. However, version 6 of the Internet Protocol uh, upgraded the number of addresses available to the point where we can have 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addressable points on a given Internet. Um, so that means that's about as much uh, addressable places in the world as there are grains of sand on every beach in the world. So really everything in the world can send signal via the web and webware networks. So to me what that means is that the world is signal, especially if you think of how inexpensive it is to equip devices with signal. That little chip that happens to be uh, manufactured by Intel but others make them uh, costs just a few pennies. So if it costs you just a few pennies to get something enabled on the web, we really are at the point where the, the world as a whole can tell us about itself and we can talk to the world via the web, just about anything on the web. And of course this is going to have huge economic implications. How huge I think can be seen uh, if we look at some data from Cisco that was cobbled together. Uh, they looked at this uh, market that they call the Internet of Everything which is about all the things that can be connected to the Internet, uh, machines, sensors, and what have you. And they began to scale out, well, what's the total economic impact? And they estimated that between now and 2022, uh, there is about $14.4 .4 trillion of economic activity that will be created solely by the, the fact that there's more addressable things out there in the world and more, direct, more information that we can get from existing systems by semantic processing and big, big data analytic tools. So it's a gigantic impact that we're looking at. And that's just the things, if you will. There's also us, the billions of people that are now equipped with sensors in the world. And if we think of our typical mobile phone that you may have right beside you or in front of you as we're, um, as we're talking, uh, that device has typically about 17 sensors in it for acceleration, geopositioning, uh, your speaker, your camera, and so on. There's about seven, at least 17 sensors and counting as uh, new devices get more sensors all the time. And if you look at that and multiply that into the number of sensor equipped smartphones that are being uh, sold every year, there are about 32 billion new personal sensors entering the world just in this year alone. So we really are well on the road of that uh, image of having everything in the world being connected to the world via sensors. So you know the obvious play here that you can think about is that, well, gee, that's a lot of data equals big data, this concept that we, uh, you're talking about in your class. And big data is, of course, uh, the ability to use uh, various tools, including open source software, be able to crunch this information and to come up with meaningful patterns. But to me, it's not just about the patterns. It's what big data helps us to do faster and better with these analytics. So taking a look at, at uh, this screenshot here, this is a, uh, a work, workflow tool for people in the medical industry to understand what are the potential outcomes of medical treatments and how they apply to specific patients. So they can look at all the possible options that they have in terms of the probability of positive outcomes and to be able to make decisions more rapidly, more effectively, and in a more tailored manner than ever before. So it's just not a matter that we can uh, understand things through big data. We can take actions, and very specific actions, much more effectively than ever before. So 
with that in mind, um, I, that's the overall idea of what Signal is about. We get massive amounts of information and we can decide very specific and tailored actions. Uh, what's creating this signal though? Uh, it's a combination of what we could call the five S's. Uh, folks like me who are analysts who are always coming up with clever little mnemonics like this. So, you know, the five S's, S S's are sensors, social, semantics, analyzed at scale, and web cloud services. And we're going to be going through that now to understand in a little bit of detail what each of these S's is about in terms of their value in creating this uh, mixture that we call signal. First of all, we have sensors, and I alluded to that a little bit already. And uh, as you can see here on Da Vinci's very famous uh, illustration of the movements of, uh, of a human being, uh, I've overlaid just a, a, a sampling of the source of sensors that are available. We have, of course, the mobile appliances that I mentioned before, things like mobile phones and tablets. Uh, smartwatches are getting much more popular these days, and we just had an announcement yesterday of Google's um, entering into the uh, smart, smart uh, wearable market there. Uh, we also have things like Fitbit that are uh, monitoring our providing signal from our bodies you know, as we're exercising and moving. We have appliances like Google Glass that are a combination of sensors and display technologies. We have contact lenses that can be uh, inserted into an eye and send back data on uh, what, what is the state of our bodies in relation to uh, symptoms of diabetes. We have uh, things like GoPro cameras that can provide HD video uh, that uh, make everybody uh, a movie producer on the go, if you will. Uh, health, uh, heart monitoring, uh, internal devices that will uh, provide medical metrics and even pho photographs simply by swallowing a sensor. Uh, pedometers, uh, smart fabrics that are equipped with the ability to read things such as uh, tension in our, in our body. Uh, patches that can be put on our skin to understand how we're moving and based on how we're stretching and what our body temperature is and so on. All these and many more you know, give us the ability to understand location, altitude, motion, sound. All that is signal in motion that uh, is an amazingly complex and rich fabric of information that goes well beyond the sorts of on-off sorts of information that we used to get. Um, and it's not just uh, things that are in motion, it's also what we're learning about the world as a whole in specific locations. And one of the, the big breakthroughs that we've had in recent years are very cheap and affordable sensors that can tell us about what's happening in the physical world outside of our bodies. So be it in agriculture where we have soil sensors that can be solar powered, such as this simple device, and have a radio transmitter uh, connected to it. These sorts of things can be deployed by hundreds or thousands and more to be able to help folks in agriculture to understand growing conditions in much more greater detail than ever before. Uh, and there are also industrial applications for things such as chemicals, um, density of materials, and so on. A lot of these are at the industrial level, but increasingly they're being pushed towards consumer appliances. So, for example, uh, in one of my consulting opportunities, I was working with a company that was trying to understand how chemical sensors could be integrated into smartphones for both consumer and industrial use. So, you know, but the important thing is to understand, you know, what is happening at a specific location that we can know about. And all of a sudden, locations become not just places, but resources to tell us about the world. And all this gets in integrated often into social media. And where we are, what we're looking at, you know, creates a wide variety of sorts of services. And sometimes we're publishing that information, sometimes we're consuming it. But it's um, all revolving around under uh, getting a better semantic understanding of topics, emotions, opinions, tastes, relationships, activities, and uh, profiles of individuals. And my matching up that mix into services that are tailored for specific people in specific places at specific times. And this just happens to be an example of one, uh, an application called Waze, a company that was bought by Google recently. And Waze has the ability to tell us about things that are ahead of us 
uh, on the road that we're driving on. So you know, we can learn about traffic conditions, but also about things that we like to stop at. Maybe it's a donut shop if that happens to be your thing, or a restaurant, or um, people, and so on. All that can be part of your view as you're going down a road. So you know, the ability to get a signal from and for people uh, and to be able to interpret it uh, via big data analysis is, is extremely important. But then we get into the topic of semantic analytics um, as the third S here. And this gets a, a lot more complicated recently. It used to be the semantics was pretty much about crunching words, looking at the grammar of a sentence or a tweet or any sort of text source and being able to understand what are the patterns of that using massive data applica uh, analytic applications based on big, big data, uh, data harvesting tools. And that's all well and good, but what's happening now is that there are more things because of this signal map that we have out there that people can apply semantics to. Uh, and this abstract image that you see on this slide is the result of a computer program looking at a movie and trying to understand what's important in the movie simply by un trying to understand what the field of motion is within the frame of the movie. And this happened to be the pattern for uh, what the computer decided was important in watching the movie The Matrix. So there's a computer's uh, interpretation of what's important in The Matrix. And as you can see, it's kind of an abstract signal-based interpretation of what that movie is about. I think that's a good metaphor for what's happening with the visual analysis in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, we're beginning to get uh, information about aesthetics, relationships, language, focus, intent, conditions, and patterns from visual inputs and more abstract inputs to give us a much broader understanding of what our relationship to data and information is at a specific point in time. And it's beginning to correlate a lot more to the complex web of understanding that the human mind itself is able to generate from sensors and other sorts of inputs. And the net result of these uh, sorts of capabilities are the ability to provide things that are organized in much more human ways and much more personal ways. Um, if we look at a service like Google Plus that I use fairly often, then you may be used to looking at photos that you've uploaded onto that service. Now, they, they store the photos, that's, that's all fine. But what they also do is have they organize the photographs based on their composition, their aesthetic composition. Their semantic software is able to look at various pictures of scenery and be able to detect which of these scenic photos is the most scenic and to make that higher in the list of photos that you see than other photos. They can look at a photo there of faces and be able to understand, well, that's an interesting group portrait, or that's a nice individual portrait, and so on. And to be able to organize those photos in a, in a way that is aesthetically pleasing. And that's something that just didn't exist as a consumer service just a, a couple of years ago. This is something that's brand new that people are doing because they're able to get a signal out of pictures and rather than simply saying, well, it's a bucket of data. This to me is one of the more visual metaphors for what we're, we're doing here in, this, in, in the era of signal. We're not just collecting data, we're trying to signify what its human importance is. And they do also funny things. If you're watching the YouTube video of this and you might see little snowflakes coming down in that picture in the lower left-hand quadrant. Um, and you'll be able to see those if you look at the deck in Google Drive also. And those are snowflakes that have been generated by Google as kind of a little uh, special effect. In other words, you know, what happened is that uh, Google was able to look at that picture and say, ah, oh, this is a winter scene, equals apply funny snowflakes. Now you can look at the picture without the snowflakes too. But that's the sort of value add that uh, happens now that you don't have to wait even for the consumer to be able to just to decide, gee, maybe I'll make an interesting, more interesting looking picture. You can do value add services through these sorts of semantic tools uh, by understanding what the signal is in, in something like a photograph. So 
Um, semantics are also about refining seeing in uh, some very revolutionary ways. Um, and some of the technology that is beginning to come to market is helping us to map more spaces than ever before. If you've ever used something like Google Maps, you may be familiar with something called Street View. And Street View it gives us views of what's happening along a particular route as a car drives down it with a specially mounted camera. Well, that's all well and good, but you know that's just that's uh, relatively general visual information, and there are only so many places that people can walk. Now we're getting to an era of technology where somebody can be equipped with a specific sort of sensor in the camera, uh, in, in a mobile phone or some other mobile device, and get not just a 3D uh, visual map uh, akin to what you might be able to get in something like Street View, but a data map that understands just how big a space is and to be able to measure that space and to get other sorts of spatial information beyond just the, the camera lens about what it is to move through that space, temperature, as well as distance. And so all of a sudden we be begin to get very detailed maps of not just um, you know, places on uh, a geographic map, but to have any place inside or outside the world have a very specific geography. And that's going to have a lot of uh, very important meaning as we begin to understand that everybody can be a mapper of the world through these sorts of technologies. Now, a lot of this sort of uh, technology started to grow up about 14 years ago uh, on the heels of uh, security events related to September 11th uh, attacks in the United States. Uh, there was a massive influx of U.S. investment in semantic technologies, and of course, through uh, the controversies revolving around NSA monitoring, uh, we know that this sort of monitoring is pervasive. And certainly there are some um, negative aspects to this, or potentially negative aspects, that we need to be aware of. But there is, if you will, a huge war benefit that's come out of this, that's gone into the, the public realm, as well as the private sector, where people now have much more sophisticated tools to change what it is what, to listen to something. It's not just that we're listening for specific words and phone conversations or, or things like that related to surveillance. But in general, being able to monitor markets, monitor large data sets or vocal uh, voicemail uh, repositories or things of that are any kind, we're able to look for different types of signals from our environment and from people. So in the instance of uh, weak signals, Weak signals was uh, a concept of being able to understand where the outliers that are grouping together that might be of importance. And that sort of analysis of data uh, grew up around uh, the, the uh, search for terrorists, but it turns out to be a very useful tool for understanding patterns in science and marketing and so on. Um, and we begin to understand the more uh, detail, you know, what what is important in asymmetrical data groupings? Where are we seeing idioms being used that can be of importance? You know, where are the nuances and gestures uh, through various sorts of inputs that uh, give us a more human sense of what people are or are not about to do? Uh, there could be something as simple as understanding when a, a wink using an appliance like Google Glass means take a picture. Uh, you know, what are people's attitudes and what is their likelihood of doing something next? And all that has pretty um, clear implications for the surveillance uh, culture that's grown up in the United States and elsewhere. But that surveillance capability applied to beneficial things to society can create great value. Uh, and it's um, this, this redefining of listening, uh, I think especially uh, also hits our, our visual capabilities as well as sound. Um, and so if we think about sound in addition to the visuals and the text, I think one of the things that we're seeing much more now in appliances is this concept of always on sound, uh, be it something in a, an appliance at Google Glass or many of our sm smartphone phones now, it can respond to audi audible commands and uh, to be listening to our environment in an always on way to be able to understand 
you know, what is important to us to uh, at, a, at a given point in time. So far, it's just command-oriented, but uh, increasingly, these sorts of services are going to be moving towards an environment where the uh, appliance is listening to our environment and predictively deciding what it is that we might be interested in having at a particular point in time. So this is a, a huge opportunity. Right now, it's command-oriented, relatively structured, but I think we're going to be moving towards much more unstructured aspects of this sort of technology. And semantics um, has been playing a huge role for many years already in financial markets. <clears throat> in financial markets, if you look at this graph, this is a graph of the volume of stocks being traded in the Standard Poor's 500 index. Uh, and just emphasize, this is not a matter of whether the price of the stock went up or down. This is simply a matter of how many shares were traded of a specific stock. And what has happened in the last 10 or so years is that we've seen a huge influx in semantic analytic tools that have enabled financial institutions to make huge bets on the financial markets based on semantic analytics. So what happens is that they certainly look at things like stock prices and stock tickers that you may be familiar with but financial institutions are going out there and they're harvesting information from things such as websites and social media channels and pretty much anything that can provide analysis, including some of the things that we've been talking about, trying to get signals from the market that would, should, would indicate whether a particular security buying or selling strategy should be put into effect. And this is simply mushroomed in the last uh, decade or so and has been hauled in a bit because of regulations and some uh, monitoring cap capabilities that have come online to be able to understand when markets have gone too far in pressing some of the financial limits of our economic system. Uh, but were it not for those sorts of uh, capabilities, then uh, these bets would have probably just kept on accelerating indefinitely. And that shows us the, the financial value of being able to understand these things and their immediate impact, what some people call real-time impact. That's to me is one of the huge differences uh, that the signal, the signal capability is provided. We're able to crunch so much information with big data analytics so rapidly to understand what is the next right thing to do that the ability to act on that understanding in real-time versus your competitors that have similar capabilities has pushed things such as financial markets to the point where they need to, need to be able to act on these opportunities in time frames that are sub millisecond. So I doubt that in the consumer market we're going to get that fast anytime soon, but you know, be aware that it's about what we can do now that makes a difference uh, with this concept of signal using big data processing. So semantics are also redefining how we innovate. And they really are beginning to create massive shortcuts in how somebody's idea of what a product or a material could be can be translated into reality. And this is an example of an appliance called Leap Motion uh, that responds to human gestures and translates them into motion on a computer screen. Uh, and as you can see, it's translating it into 3D interpretation of motion. If you've ever uh, played with a Microsoft Xbox, you may have played with a Kinect appliance on, on uh, those devices as it reads your uh, gestures and motions. This is what you might say is a, a Kinect on steroids, if you will, uh, that is a plot for industrial use and, and creative use. So, you know, what you do for play is now something that can be used in industry and research to be able to uh, accelerate the ability of people to innovate. Instead of just having a doodle on a cocktail napkin, you can use the tools such as Leap Motion to be able and software that integrates with it to create an idea of what something could look like and then translate it into a prototype very rapidly using technologies such as 3D printing. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the implications of that. Uh, momentarily. Um, and 
Finally, uh, before I take a break here for some questions, everything is analyzable. Um, scale is one of the things that makes all this happen. When we talk about big data, big data implies huge computing resources. And the ability of massive compu massively scalable compute computing to be put online via the internet at a moment's notice via services such as uh, Amazon EC3 and uh, other cloud web services. Uh, all of a sudden, anybody can do massive commuting, computing at the drop of a hat at a very affordable price. And so these rapid, rapidly scalable resources means that just about anybody can be out there crunching massive data sets affordably. And this is leading to this era that I'm uh, moving you towards of real-time artificial intelligence. We have resources out there in the cloud that can come closer than ever before of thinking like a human. And more to the point, they can come up with human-like inclusions in human-like time frames. All of a sudden, you come, aha, with the realization that it doesn't take days, weeks, months, or whatever to come up with, but you come up with conclusions right now. And uh, so it means that you know big data and uh, cloud processing is a lot less about storage and retrieval and a lot more about signifying. What does it all mean? And that's a lot more analogous to what we do with our human mind, of course. In the process of structuring that information, in uh, the cloud, um, we are applying syntax to things in ways that we haven't before at scale. Um, there are tools that are examples of, of this out there. If you've ever uh, gone to Google search results, you may have noticed that if you say look for uh, an historical person like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, that there'll be little snippets of information that appear on the right hand side of your search results. Well, that's the result of a semantic tool called Google Knowledge Graph. And that's an entity mapping service that allows uh, various uh, entities, such as people, places, and things, uh, to be mapped to understand their relationship to one another. And each link there is a, is a, is a causal or verbal or, or relationship between those entities. So Galileo might be related to Copernicus and so on. But the, the depth of this sort of map is getting richer and richer by the moment. You know, for example, you may have a famous place that's in that Google Knowledge Graph. Well, guess what? The social media that is created about that place becomes part of that map also. So personal experiences and personal relationships to these entities become fair game for this sort of Knowledge Graph understanding. And similarly, uh, tools like Knowledge Graph can be used inside of consumer uh, services such as Facebook, Google Plus, or, or Twitter, or what have you, to understand what are the relationships between individuals um, by the millions or hundreds of millions or billions in much more detail. So all of a sudden, the sorts of tools that are used by libraries and so on to organize information are becoming the sorts of tools that help to organize all human knowledge and all present knowledge of the world as it exists today and everybody's relationships to people, places, and things as they exist in the moment uh, as, as one huge knowledge graph all, all knitted together. The result of this is something that I call uh, predictive services. Everything is predictive in this sort of world. And um, predictive analytics is an important part of the, the net outcome of being able to apply signal. So, uh, for example, if you're using an appliance like Google Glass, um, not only can you do things like take pictures and videos with it and stuff like that, but if you scroll through some of the uh, panes on Google Glass, you receive information based on some technology of Google's called Google Now that is predicting the sort of information that you might be interested in right now. So, you know, it'll pop up, hey, we know that you like Thai food. And so there's a, a great Thai restaurant that's not far from you right now. Or, you know, we know from your emails without you having done anything that you're about to fly from San Francisco to New York. So here's information about what's happening with your flight. We're just going to guess that you might be in, interested in this. 
or based on some of the movies that you're watching on Google Play, Google Play Movies, uh, our, their home uh, video rental service, similar to things from Amazon and Netflix and so on, we're guessing that you might be interested in some of these movies that are playing nearby you in theaters. Or if you're uh, traveling and you want to understand what are some interesting sites nearby or other sorts of things, here's some photos that come from uh, landmarks, restaurants, and other things that might be of interest to you. So, and if you're walking into a store with just a mobile phone, uh, the phone is uh, going to be aware of that, and then service like Google Now can say, oh, you're in Home Depot, maybe you want to be looking for product information in a store like that. So in all of these things, you can see uh, the, the value of predictive analytics tying into commercial services. And what it means is that we have the ability to massively predict personal demand and action. And that is going to have huge implications for uh, the marketing of products and services. And what it means ultimately, I think, is that pretty much anything that the web touches becomes much more service-oriented. And that word service begins to be uh, more associated less with massive services for uh, mass market services, but massively customized services to the point where products that are just right for you become a service and vice versa. So if we look at something like these, these are prosthetics that have been uh, generated by a 3D computer. Uh, somebody was scanned by some uh, center technology and understanding the exact dimensions of a person's leg uh, the printer was able to print out components that could be assembled in the prosthetics that were an exact fit for that person's legs uh, using surgical stainless steel and high-grade uh, car carbon reinforced plastics. So uh, all of a sudden things that would might have cost tens of thousands of dollars to do on a, a custom basis like this can be made very rapidly and affordably. So, and that's just one simple example of what happens when you hook up signal it tells us the exact needs of somebody at a particular point in time to technologies that can deliver things to meet a person's exact needs, not just in terms of information, but translating the information into physical objects. And so we're at an era in which uh, we can afford to customize anything. And the sort of signal-driven links to things can transform practically any industry. You know, before we were just looking there at um, medical devices, but s something as simple as the lock in the door in your house or apartment, you make that internet enabled, and all of a sudden something that was just a piece of metal that you picked up at the hardware store or what have you becomes a platform for services. Or same thing with Nest thermostats. Um, that all this, that are internet enabled and so on. There are many uh, a galaxy of devices for home security and monitoring and management. They're all internet enabled. And just a few years ago, those were just inexpensive things. And now all of a sudden, those things become a, a vast platform to, for delivering value add services. So pretty much anything that the web touches that can uh, create and absorb signal becomes a services platform. And it, it means that the sort of radical transformation and disruption that we've seen in information services via the internet, internet all of a sudden has the ability to transform practically any industry uh, that has the ability to be connected by the internet. Not simply because we can address it, but because we can understand via big data analytics what it is that people want and need, both individually and on a massive scale. And the ability to interpret uh, signal into action is getting far more sophisticated than ever. Uh, it's probably no coincidence that a company like Google has gone out there and bought um, several uh, companies over the past several months, at least six or seven that are related to robotics or artificial intelligence. To be able, the ability to be able to understand signal and translate it into physical action is where the economic activity is going to be over the next decade. And you students especially should be aware of that, to be able to understand that the ability to understand the world as it is and to be able to translate it into human-like responses based on signal processing is where the economic opportunity is going to be. And it can transform pretty much any industry if you give it a chance. 
Um, you know, automobile manufacturers are very on to this trend because they understand that uh, their their appliances, automobiles, are becoming commoditized, and they're trying to come up with formulas for more profitable cars. And the truth of the matter is that uh, innovation is a very expensive thing in the auto industry, as it is in many industries. So one of the things that we're seeing there is the uh, evolution of an open source vehicle platform, where there are freely available blueprints, if you will, that are developed collaboratively by people to be able to create a car that's non-proprietary, and that you can plug in various products and services into that um, that vehicle by electronics and and uh, to be able to custom and uh, mechanics as well to be able to make that uh, internet enabled vehicle much more intelligent and to be able to get signal back from that platform to be able to help people understand how to make that open source vehicle more productive uh, and more more affordable more responsive to consumer needs and on a private basis companies like Ford and General Motors are also equipping their their, their uh, vehicles with signal platforms as well. But the idea that uh, just as the Android operating system leveled the playing field in mobile phones, all of a sudden that idea of using signal via the internet to be able to level an entire industry like automobiles is on the horizon. So I'm going to take a break here in a moment to check in with the, um, with the uh, class system to see if there are any questions that have come up so far. But in summary for this, before I wrap it up with uh, talking about the Signal economy itself, um, this is a summary of what Signal is really changing. You know, we're moving from an era of information to an era of predictive services, an era of auto-categorization to an era of auto-contextualization, an era of building data sets to an era of signifying data sets, from extracting entities to mapping realities, the world as it is, from computing to thinking machines, from simple analysis of big data to tailored actions that people can take through big data. So this was a little bit wordier than I typically do for the actual keynote. The keynote I tend to uh, ask through this a little bit faster, but since this is the course that gave you a little bit more information than I would typically. So I'm going to take a break here now and go over to the, the class system to see if there are any questions. Since this is asynchronous, I'm guessing that there may not be. But um, I'll just take a quick scan. And I'm not seeing any questions there. I'm going to take a quick look over here on the Google Hangouts, and I don't see anything here so far. So uh, for people who are in the class, just be aware that um, I will be available for questions throughout the day. And I will um, also be available for responding to questions later on in the week, Thursday and Friday. I'll uh, be monitoring for questions about an hour or so each day. So if there are uh, thoughts or questions that you have regarding these materials as we're moving along, then uh, feel free to just pop them out uh, in the class system and I'll be glad to respond to them. Okay, so let me, through the miracle of technology, go back to the deck. So, that's a fair amount to absorb, but we've taken a, a few seconds of a, a break here. Hope we had a chance to uh, grab some coffee and what have you. So this is what Signal is doing, and as we can see, there is uh, a lot of potential economic impact through this concept. So let me just briefly define what I call the Signal economy. I think of it as the generation, collecting, organizing, and analysis of signals that drive economic activity predictably at unprecedented scale. And I think uh, the idea of driving economic activity predictably is one of the key things. If we think back to that Wall Street graph from a few slides back, that's what we're talking about, the potential economic impact to the world as a whole as we began to interpret things by big data analytics to get signal from massive data sets to be able to act on it. And one of the key things I want to emphasize is that we're moving from an era of hypothesis-driven mass planning cycles to signal-driven targeted production cycles. Well, that sounds like, you know, a lot of words. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that it's here, it's real, and it's in physical products and services that are being used today. Uh, these pretty things that you see, uh, basically jewelry, um, uh, it's just simple but beautiful examples of what can be produced by 3D printers today by a service called Shapeways. Basically, an artisan can come up with a design, and they can transmit the design via the web to Shapeways, and now pops their idea in physical materials, including metals. Um, and there are much more sophisticated versions of what can be 3D printed today in metals, including things such as components for rockets. So this is serious stuff. This is not just toys. And what it really means is that we have the ability to understand and fulfill unique demands at scale before others even see them, using less time, fewer resources, and more effective filtering of options. Um, and in the broader scale of things, I think that this means that we're uh, re-empowering the artisan craftsman economy that we had in the 18th century as one particular set point before mass manufacturing in the 19th century began to transform uh, what was being made for people from very uh, specific individually crafted items for specific people to mass market items. And now we have the ability to create massively personal markets through the signal economy. To understand how to do that, though, means that marketing as, as a, a discipline is changing. We still today spend billions, if not and truly trillions of dollars, on trying to stimulate people to go to the shelf and buy something through advertising. And we're all familiar with how that happens. But on this slide, where you see ZMOT, that stands for Zero Moment of Truth. And I encourage you to go to zeromomentoftruth.com, which is a site that uh, helps people to understand how marketing is affected by the web and this concept of signal. You know, before people make a decision to buy things, because of the massive amount of information on the web in terms of ratings, reviews, recommendations, social media interactions, videos, and so on, uh, there's an informed decision that's uh, taking shape, often right in front of the shelf, and be it a physical shelf or an online shelf. It's just not a matter of stimulating people to go out there and buy something like toilet tissue. Anything that's sitting on a shelf has as an intermediary analysis. And so the, the ability to make ratings and recommendations to people is becoming more important overall than this emotional stimulus uh, from a mass marketing perspective. And even the stimulus itself gets entered into that zero moment of truth cycle as marketers begin to take hold of social media and create um, what they call content marketing pieces where they try to create uh, information uh, in what would normally be advertising space that's really more informing the uh, consumer about their product and uh, the market and why it's important and so on. So there's a conversational analytic uh, component to what's happening in marketing now because of the signal economy. Uh, because we all care about analysis. But the analysis in marketing is going even beyond that. Uh, Amazon has uh, started to implement a service called Amazon Yesterday. And what this service will do, it will ship something to your doorstep that you never ordered on the assumption that their and analytics have predicted what you will want to buy and not return. Um, you can, of course, cancel the order even before it shows up at your doorstep, or you, if it does show up, you can still return it. Uh, but they're betting that they guessed right as to what you want and when. And it will be sitting there potentially in your hands because their predictive analytics, based on big data analytics from Signal, extracted through your buying habits, your social media, your clicks, uh, has tried to target demand before it's even been expressed. So think of that in terms of zero moment of truth uh, that we just looked at there. Instead of waiting for the customer to respond to analytics, uh, the marketer in this case has taken the response out of the consumer's hand in terms of which product they're going to reach for when, and they're doing it for them. That has huge implications as to 
uh, how we try to meet people's demands in the economy. And what it means in terms of production is um, the things that show up at your doorstep may be increasingly less mass-produced items because we have this ability to crunch information from the cloud using um, big data analytics to get signal from it and to understand, aha, this is what people in general really want or a very specific cohort of people really want or a very specific person really wants. And to use that fabrication technology such as 3D printing to create something that is very tailored and therefore is going to have higher margins and higher value to the person that receives it. So, you know, this means that scalable micromarkets are reality. So we're going from an era of mass market, mass production to massively customized production. That's going to have huge implications for the world. And this economy is also sensing its own demands for things, not just waiting for uh, companies like Amazon to be able to respond for them, to them. So you know, we have services like Kickstarter where innovators can go out and publicize things that they would like to manufacture. And you may be familiar with Kickstarter. If you go to kickstarter.com, you can look at promotional materials for people who are trying to raise funds to do things like make films or, or other sorts of artistic activities, but also to make stuff. So uh, here's an example of the Pebble Watch that was crowdfunded and lots and lots of people signed up to buy something that didn't even exist yet. And all of a sudden Pebble is a reasonably strong brand in smartwatches. And it's a very, uh, very profitable small company because they knew exactly what people wanted uh, based on the feedback they got from raising funds for people to buy what they had not made yet. So that's like mass custom manufacturing. Um, and if you look at what happens in, in Kickstarter, there's so much great stuff that's happening there um, that people can get money to make things. Um, through this sort of mechanism. And basically the market itself, through its funding of these things, is creating signal as to what people are willing to pay for. If you're uh, also studying marketing, then you understand that there's a lot of research that goes into that sort of stuff. All of a sudden, this is basically saying, let's short circuit that. Let's just you know, say, do you want this? And if people want it, they're going to pay for us to build it for them. That's a whole different sort of economic cycle that we're used to. Uh, in mass manufacturing. So I, I want to focus on this uh, slide for a moment. It's very complicated, uh, way too complicated. Um, but the under, underlying quadrant diagram there is from a company called Cognitive Edge. And this is what's called a Kinefin diagram. It was, uh, the concept was developed uh, by a gentleman named David Snowden, very uh, bright analytic fellow who came up with some analytics for looking at information uh, from uh, the government to identify terrorist cells. That was one of the initial applications of his technology. However, now it's being used by profit-driven profit and non-profit entities very widely to understand patterns in a much different way. Well, the long and the short of this is that in the typical uh, research and production cycle, uh, we would try to understand in the realm of the complex you know, what was important in a particular market and to come up with hypotheses that would be validated by experts in that upper right hand quadrant and when the expert said yes this is a valid hypothesis then we would find ways to be able to apply that hypothesis to markets through various systems and production capabilities including people uh, in a much more simplistic way uh, and apply the best practices defined by the experts to that product or service. So, you know, if we think of that in terms of, if we think of that in terms of um, the signal economy, things are shifting. You know, the money used to be down in the lower right-hand quadrant uh, and spent in the upper right-hand quadrant to get it to come out of the lower, lower right-hand quadrant. But increasingly the, the money is being, uh, the value is in that upper left hand quadrant. But understanding what hypotheses might be good to pursue. 
And it's a much different sort of environment in which we understand the economy. Uh, instead of you know developing a hypothesis, testing it all the way through, if you think of the example we just saw with the Pebble watch, uh, we're essentially saying, well, we think this might be a good idea for a watch. The money comes, and boom. We already know how to produce this thing because the experts are engaged in this realm of the complex, be able to understand what might be a, a good idea for a product, and all of a sudden, boom, we have the technology to create it, very simply. So if you think what that means in terms of how organizations are, are innovative and creative and productive, it means the experts are no longer stuck in that upper right-hand quadrant, the white ivory tower, if you will. Uh, they're more shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with uh, the, sense, the information from the signal economy in the realm of the complex and probing and sensing and responding to those signals much more directly. In the meantime, the systems that used to take on uh, simply production activities are now much more engaged in the analysis and uh, filtering of potentially good options that the human experts used to take on. So that realm of the complicated, in a sense, is being taken over by the systems, thanks to big data analytics, semantics, and things of that sort. So the human activity increasingly is going to be focused in the economy in this realm of the complex, which is a much more collaborative, uh, less hierarchical realm uh, for that's driven by these data analytics. And I think overall that's the beautiful thing because what it means is that we're going to be a lot less focused on the value of success because, you know, we had mass markets focus so much on the, on the value of what is going to work successfully on a massive scale. Well, the truth of the matter is that you can only succeed so rapidly and uh, so effectively on a massive scale because of having to invest in these specific hypotheses. Instead, this idea of fast failure becomes much more important than to be able to understand what is the value of failure. And if we think of it, the classic example of how penicillin was uh, discovered, it was actually a failure that created the aha moment that said, wait a minute, there's something valuable here. And there was a petri dish that had been spoiled by some mold, and the uh, scientist that uh, was looking at it, was about to throw it out, and then it noticed some funny things happening. You notice some funny things happening at the edge of that mold, and all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, that was an antibiotic activity there. There was something happening that was fighting the mold that had developed in the dish. And that was the development of the first mass market um, antibiotic, penicillin. And because of penicillin, many people were saved. Uh, during World War II, whose lives otherwise would have been lost. So it had huge economic act, um, huge economic impact. It was because something had gone wrong. And so in the signal economy, we have the ability to rapidly go through all sorts of potential hypotheses and to detect more rapidly when they might succeed or fail, and to be able to therefore test more multiple hy hypotheses more rapidly and to adjust the potential for success in those hypotheses more rapidly as we move forward on a more ad hoc basis to test things on a smaller scale that can then move up more rapidly as already implemented product services or uh, innovations into from uh, very targeted uh, specific trials to mass market implementation either on a, on a custom basis or on a standardized basis. So, you know, to wrap this all up, I'm going to try to keep it uh, as close to an hour as I can. I started about an hour ago. Um, what does this all mean for folks in the media side of things? Um, if we think of traditional publishers, uh, publishers like to be in an environment where they control everything. It's uh, what some people in the industry call a walled garden. Uh, they like to take their own data, text, and media, apply their own editorial uh, curation and uh, shaping of it, and then control the distribution of it. And that's the way publishing was for centuries. But then along came the web, and the web was a lot more like uh, a bazaar 
than a walled garden where everybody's stuff was out there on equal footing and you had to be able to uh, express the value of your stuff much more rapidly in, in a kind of a TMI sort of environment. Too much information about stuff in a bazaar. So getting people's attention is relatively hard. And of course, so your stuff was one of many things, including social media, all sorts of websites and apps, and search and distribution technologies weren't necessarily in your control. And what really happened as a result of this is that demand was kind of the king of web. That is, if you could understand what content people wanted before they wanted it, then you, you would be doing pretty well. And that turned out to be relatively hard for a lot of traditional publishers. If we think of what's happening with big data analytics and signal, what we're seeing is the third iteration of this change where we're going from just information being a bizarre to everything being in the bizarre model, which means that um, everything is up for grabs in terms of what information can drive. And the good news is that it can drive uh, custom or mass manufacturing, uh, massively tailored uh, services such as uh, drone, drone delivery of packages, which seems bizarre to some people perhaps, but it's becoming a reality. Um, Customized traffic, uh, where people, uh, services like Google now can predict what trips you might be taking in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and uh, or things like reminding you of reservations, uh, things of that sort are what I call predictive services built on analytics, and publishers find themselves in the situation of having to adapt to the fact that their stuff, web stuff, all this information from sensors and big data fields have to be crunched up through analytics to provide more predictive services. And this is where the value is in the publishing market. It parallels what happened in the financial information industry a decade ago and more. Uh, and now it's going to be true of all media and publishing um, and all information services. You have to focus on predictive analytics to be able to understand what is the do out of all this information, not just the what. So my advice to publishers is don't hide from this, like kids used to hide from the A-bomb in the 1950s with duck and cover. Um, make it your content aware of what it makes it valuable right now in the real-time signal-driven economy. So really, if you're in uh, a place of considering a career in media, I think you need to master signals, understand that you need to build services and relationships that deliver it and act on it. It can't be just putting out information for information's sake or data's for data's sake. Tell us what we can do with it. You know, can your signal from your content be found and adjusted easily for decision making and action? Is it structured in a way that will enable action-oriented analytics? And often that's not true. Um, if you look at uh, you know what the reality of data sets are out there, they're not necessarily structured in that knowledge graph sort of way. Uh, there are services out there that are getting smarter about that, and those are the ones that are going to drive economic activity. Most importantly, I think, in the, the signal economy, we need to follow the verbs. Uh, the verbs of entity relationships that I talked about in that Google Knowledge Graph, those verbs are shifting increasingly in real time, and understanding the subtleties of what are the actions that people are taking or might take as a result of a relationship are where uh, people in content technology services can create a lot of value. And at the same time, you know, we can become experts in those entity relationships and start creating new adjectives and adverbs, especially using the input from sensors, um, to be able to understand what are the subtleties and nuances of uh, relationships in this rich semantic map. Uh, that others may miss and that will allow people to take action more effectively and authoritatively. Um, unfortunately for publishers, you know, people don't read <laughs> as much as they used to, um, in spite of what some statistics say. Um, we do read, and I think, uh, I'm hoping that you'll read some materials for this course, but in general, in terms of people's focus, people are focused on uh, services that provide massive and in instant interpretation and application of information. And if you have massive information and you're not doing that, uh, then you're really not an effective service. 
So you know, we need to think about you know what processes and actions are avail are valuable right now to succeed in the signal economy. You know, what's happening that I should be looking at that is, has escaped my focus. Uh, those are sometimes called um, edge markets, or and uh, sometimes turn into blue sky. But you have to look at the gaps sometimes, and the analytic tools of the signal economy help us to do that and to focus on the real value in, in a market at a particular time. Excuse me, I had a little hiccup here with our, our slides. I could adjust. There, I think we're adjusted. And um, also, to understand what is a valuable idea. That is, this whole idea of validating hypotheses is not just about, you know, this looks like a good idea, let's measure it and, and validate it. Increasingly, the response is, can I get in on it, a la the Kickstarter model. So monetizing idea selection and access to its testing is where a lot of the economic value is focusing. And that's why we do see services like Kickstarter succeeding. So if you're in the, in the content technology business, make sure that you're focusing on analytic, analytics producing actionable metrics, focus on tailored actions, and focus on actionable syntax for any and all content. Um, so and I'm going to leave you to look through some of these bullets in detail on, on the uh, after end of the program since I'm running a little bit long here. As I said, I provide a little more detail here that normally I would not because uh, you folks are not necessarily industry experts. Um, so in terms of services that can be created, uh, I think Google Now and its predictive capabilities, it's not a perfect service by any shot, but if you're looking for a metaphor, um, we need to move from static to predictive insights, from queries to predictive alerts, from building lists to building relationships and successful processes, from delivering facts to multi-platform actions, from indexing information to real-time knowledge mapping, and from producing research to signifying signals. I could probably even modify that last bullet to say producing research to producing things in many instances. So, you know, you folks, I hope that you're not just focusing on the low orbit opportunities because of the signal economy. There are some real moonshots out there that you can target and uh, succeed with this sort of thinking. So in closing, uh, there's a favorite quote of mine uh, that was recently put out by Satya Nadella, uh, the new CEO of Microsoft, who I hope uh, will help to revolutionize some things about that company. But you know, you have to have an early sense of what the indicators for success are as a result of the signal. And that's what signal gives us, is the ability to understand what might be successful and to be able to adjust and act on a continuing stream of signal to be able to move towards success much more rapidly and effectively. So, you know, you may think that you're just looking at a little million dollar opportunity if you happen to be an entrepreneur, but that little million dollar opportunity through the signal economy could turn into a $70 billion business before you know it because you're listening to the world in real time as it's thinking in real time and responding to it in real time. So those are my thoughts that I hope are useful for your course. Uh, you'll find my contact information in the slide deck that's available on SlideShare um, and on this uh, Goog on the Google Drive link that I provided. And I hope that this has been educational and useful. And again, my name is John Blossom, and it's been my pleasure uh, to be providing you with this information. And I look forward to your questions uh, later on in the uh, class system. Thanks very much, and uh, feel free to reach out to me on Google Plus outside of the course. But again, for now, uh, for the benefit of the class, try to keep your questions inside the class system. Thanks.